Hi guys, this is Aubrey. Hey, where are you at?
Off day. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Manny from the University of Guam. Uh, we're getting a lot of background noise from some of you, so I'm just going to go ahead and mute everybody. And when you're ready to speak, you can unmute yourself. So uh, I apologize in advance. Just going to mute everybody. We're getting a lot of background noise. Thanks. Good day, everybody. This is Aubrey Moore at the University of Guam. I'd like to start out by thanking Manny Hechenova and the Office of Information Technology here at the University of Guam for hosting this meeting. Uh, you'll notice that we are recording the whole meeting for later use. So uh, happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody on this side of the dateline. <laughs> So we're getting a lot of a lot of participation here. Mm -hmm. Thirty-four participants so far, and they're still coming in. Got my green. <laughs> so they're recording this. So that means we have to behave. Yeah. So no green beer during the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing, Chris? Just, Good. Just thanks. Oh, that's another one. <laughs> Just out of self quarantine, so. so. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Not to that, for less houses us. Oh, you got some feedback there. Is it okay now? They're getting feedback from your end. Only when you talk. <laughs> Are you using two different devices? 
That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Can you mute the other one? Yeah. Okay, now we can't hear you. So Aubrey, are we starting or are we waiting for more people? Uh, I, I think we should start. Lastus, we can see your slides. Looks very nice. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I thought that Trevor was going to lead the then, show. Uh, yep. Trevor, are you going to be the, the guy yes. leading the show? Okay, okay. can everybody hear me okay? Great. Can Hello. you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. Yep. Good. Wow, kia ora tatu. And um, welcome everybody. We've got a, a good um, a good group, an expanded group this time, and uh, it's good to see some faces that I haven't seen before. Uh, I can see Benoit there, and some faces that I've seen in the past, like Bob. So it's it's very good to have Bob back in the in the fold, so to speak. Um, what we are going to do is is um, pretty much follow the uh, follow the program agenda that we we set around sent around and have the situation updates to start with um, and then followed by the science presentations. Um, as, as Aubrey has said, this um, the meeting will be recorded and um, be available afterwards. So, um, and we'll also circulate a summary of notes, decisions made um, uh, through, the, through the program. Um, if you have any questions or comments, through the presentations, please put them into uh, the chat format and we can pick them up, uh, which is at the bottom of your, your screen and write them in. Um, and then we can pick them up at the in the discussion time. Um, but I think that's that's it. So does anybody have any any questions before we start? OK, that's good. So. We're going to start with the South Pacific situation update. Um, and uh, Sean is going to lead off on that. Yeah, kia ora, everybody. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have a few presentations uh, that were put together by um, some of the, the country uh, Pacific countries. Um, and but just before that, I thought I'd just um, present uh, actually, I need to present, don't I? Um, just to give everybody, because uh, there will be a few uh, people who um, aren't aren't as familiar as others uh, with this. So uh, I'll just share my screen. Um, and this is just going to provide a very quick overview. Uh, if I can get it up and going, share. Right, so hopefully you can all see that. Um, so th this is just... Uh, just to uh, remind everybody um, where thing where coconut rhinoceros beetle is generally found. Um, it's native to um, Southeast Asia and other parts of Asia, including India and whatnot. Um, there are some questions in terms, so that's all the green balloons. There are some questions about um, some of the locations that have been reported as having them. They may have been misidentified or um, or they may be there, but um, they, uh, they are a little bit questionable. Um, and the red balloons indicate um, the invasive areas, what's considered invasive areas for coconut rhinoceros beetle. Um, and as you can see, um, it's present in Indian Ocean. And um, like for the group today, um, we're primarily interested in, in the Pacific region here. Um, and I'll, I think I'll just leave it at that. Um, uh, other than to say that um, there have been a couple of waves um, of invasion from different parts of the world into the Pacific. Um, and that's um, partly why we're all here today. Uh, so with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll invite New Caledonia 
um, to uh, to put up their presentation. Now, uh, this is Elodie, um, forgive me if I've pronounced um, your name wrong, but Elodie Nakamaru. Yep. Um, from a uh, biosecurity team in, in New Caledonia. And and if you, uh, she told me that she hasn't, uh, isn't so familiar with Zoom. So if you do need any assistance, um, I've, I've got your presentation and I can put that up if, if you need that. Yeah, it should be okay. Do you hear me well? Yes. Does it okay with uh, sounds? Okay. So I will share my presentation here. Okay. So <laughs> I have the privilege to begin. <laughs> Uh, Lakshan told us, uh, told you that I'm Elodina Kamara. I'm working uh, as a plant pathologist uh, for the government of New Caledonia and uh, working also on uh, the uh, eradication of CRBG uh, here in New Caledonia. So I will present you what uh, was done since the beginning uh, and the discovered of uh, the CRBG here by the Biosecurity Department of New Caledonia. Uh, so, mm. I have to change it. Sorry, I have little difficulty. Yes, here. So, uh, the first interception of uh, CRB was done in September 2019 uh, on uh, the tarmac of uh, International Airport of La uh, At this time, we uh, have made a lot of prospections in the area, but we didn't find any symptoms on palm trees or breeding sites. And uh, in October, we received the confirmation of the identification of uh, CRBG from uh, a laboratory in France and uh, another one in Australia. Uh, and uh, 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 we found uh, the first nest in a palm tree nursery uh, at the north of uh, the airport. Uh, we suppose that the beetles was attracted by the lights uh, of the airport. Uh, and at this time, the government of uh, New Caledonia took a decree to define uh, the infected zone, manage organic wastes and uh, palm tree movements. Uh, and then in February 2012, uh, Visoni Timothy from SPC came uh, during two weeks uh, in order to help us um, to improve the eradication program that we already begin in New Caledonia. Um, so here is the infected zone. Uh, I've, I'm sorry, I didn't put uh, the, the map of New Caledonia, but you can see here, this is the airport area. And we define um, this in red, the, uh, the infected zone. So this is uh, from Tomo City and Latamoa. Uh, to prospect the area and destroy, destroy the breeding sites, uh, pincer strategy uh, with the blue uh, arrow uh, was defined. And uh, we uh, and this is uh, our strategy to uh, contain the CRBG in this uh, infected zone. So, as we can see in the field in New Caledonia, we found three kinds of uh, breeding sites: dead standing coconut or palm trees, organic wastes on the ground. And also, it's quite new, dead uh, Niaoli. This is uh, endemic trees, trunks on the ground. Um, 
when breeding sites are destroyed, they are replaced by uh, uh, traps uh, like uh, drum or pipe traps uh, to reproduce those uh, habitats. Uh, they are really efficient to mass trapping. Uh, since the beginning, we also use uh, bucket traps, like you all know really well, more than me, uh, to monitor and uh, to monitor the evolution of the, the populations. Um, and uh, since the beginning of the eradication program, up to 30 people work uh, was involved uh, in uh, in the field every owners of the infected area have been uh, informed about the uh, CRBG eradication program uh, the density of traps has increased sadly since uh, the first detection and today uh, there is about uh, 200 2000 sorry <laughs> Uh, 66 traps uh, in this area. Uh, this is the sum of bucket, pipe, and drum, uh, drum uh, uh, traps. Uh, all this uh, infected area uh, was inspected. This is uh, for. Sorry. Uh, 4,000 hectares about uh, have been inspected. And only uh, 5,000 are considered like priority uh, area where uh, we targeted uh, organic waste to destroy that could be become um, um, breeding sites. Uh, to now only 13 uh, breeding sites was found and destroyed uh, as actions were put in place really quickly. Uh, CRBG is under control in uh, New Caledonia and contained in this uh, infected uh, area, this restricted area. And for this year, the program is uh, continue and we will uh, continue organic waste management, containment measures in palm trees, nurseries, uh, massive trapping, and destruction of breeding site if we found some new one. Uh, communication also, public awareness is really important and we only, uh, we are working with uh, SPC also to, to make something uh, good <laughs> for people here. And, uh, and then we, um, moreover, we would like to use uh, also metabolism anisoplea uh, in traps to threaten uh, their efficiency. This is what we, uh, we would like to do this year. Thank you, if you have questions. Thank you, Elodie, that's, that's very good and very clear. Um, one, one small question on your map, what is the significance of the red and the yellow coloring? This is the priority one and two that I talked about just before, uh, where we can find some waste, organic waste on the ground that could become uh, some breeding sites. So yep. this is the area where people, the 30 people work during the year to destroy every uh, possibility to find a, a nest. Yep, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll go through the other situation reports and then come back for a, a discussion. Okay. Thank if, you. Because there may be general points, but thank you for that. Very clear presentation. So um, back to Sean. I need to unmute first, sorry. Yes, thank you very much for that. That was, that was great. Um, um, and I can't actually see on my screen, but is Alfred um, Kambu, on the screen um, from Papua New Guinea. I'd like to invite him to put up his, his slides. Alfred, are you, have you been able to connect? Doesn't Shall we go to Vanuatu? 
Yeah, so we'll go to Vanuatu to next. Um, now Vanuatu unfortunately um, told me that they weren't able to attend, but so I'm presenting this on behalf of Tuasi Tiwok and Lasoni um, Bulasulu. And I just need to get it up here. <clears throat> And share screen. Here we go. Right. All right. Um, yes. So this is uh, the update um, uh, that Vanuatu um, has provided. And how am I going to? Right. Um, so this. This map here um, just shows uh, the island chain of, of Vanuatu here. And what we're talking about is in a re relatively recent infestation um, on the island of Afate, which is located here within the chain. Um, and it's actually uh, just the northwest corner at the, at the moment uh, that has been infested. Um, it was identified in uh, May 2019 um, in a in a village here called Mangalulu. I hope I've pronounced that right. Apologies if I haven't. Um, and it was identified as being um, uh, sort of of the CRBS clade two variety. Um, and for those of you that um, may not know, um, it matches with specimens that have been identified um, from uh, parts of Papua New Guinea as well as um, parts of uh, Solomon Islands, um, but it is, it appears to be the susceptible strain. And so they've undertook uh, an eradic or embarked on an eradication program similar to New, New Caledonia. Now the red lines here um, are, uh, or areas um, are outlining the areas where they've um, identified infestations of coconut rhinoceros beetle. And um, it is also present on the island of, of Lepa, Mosa, uh, Ifiri, in, and this, I should point out, this is Port, Port Vila, uh, for those of you that, that don't know. Um, and they've also found a couple of individuals on Pele Island. Um, and they're monitoring this area here, um, which is the black line around here as a, as a buffer zone, similar to what you just saw earlier. Um, right, so I've said some of this actually, sorry. <laughs> um, and um, what they are finding is it is, it, while it's in a relatively small area um, within Afate, they haven't identified it anywhere else um, within, within any of the other provinces, um, but it is continuing to spread out from, uh, from the infested area. Uh, now, uh, in February t um, this year, um, there's been an order signed by the government um, that restricts the movement of agricultural goods um, and machinery out of Afate on to other islands. So they're trying to do some internal biocontrol um, uh, measures. Um, and their biosecurity staff, among, other, among the other um, tasks that they, they're doing with respect to CRB, they're, um, they are going about collecting um, beetles. They've got some trap lines set up uh, to be able to monitor both within and, and outside the areas of infestations. Uh, and they're also um, recording uh, the palm damage that's happening uh, to be able to monitor um, what's going on over time uh, during their eradication program. Um, they will also be uh, obtaining a new bat, um, some fresh batches of Arictes virus. Um, and they're currently working on getting permits um, uh, in place uh, to allow this to happen. Um, uh, because that's one of the strategies they like to do. Um, so CRBG um, appears to be the, the more uh, tolerant or resistant variety. CRBS, as, as I mentioned up here, is the type S and uh, it should behave um, as expected if virus can be released into the environment. Um, they're also working on the use of um, applying metarizium um, to apply those to known breeding sites. Um, and I believe that they are setting up artificial breeding sites as well as a, as a methodology that they're trying out to, uh, to attract coconut rhinoceros beetles to those. And they're um, basically contaminating that with metarizium, again, in an attempt to try and um, 
suppress the population. Now, this is just some of the data that they've put through. Um, the, um, on some of the <coughs> trap catches that they've been able to do. So as you can see that um, the trap catches recently have gone up um, over time in October and November. And my understanding is um, that this kind of, that there's periods of time, um, which I think is in the next slide where they do have some issues um, with staff resourcing and whatnot. And I, I um, my assumption, um, if anybody from Vanuatu is, is present, please correct me, but my assumption is, is that um, around this time is um, when they've experienced some interruptions into the, some of the ability of staffing uh, to do carry out um, some of the cleanup operations that they're doing. So they're, they have done a very good job in the past of, of um, some of the sanitation to remove all the breeding sites they can find, um, but there are obviously many more um, present and this may reflect that. Um, on the right hand side uh, is the typical damage. Um, I've been told that they are seeing um, in various locations. Um, Etheria Island is a little island just off of Port, Port Vila. Um, and as you can see, there's a range of damage from sort of somewhat moderate um, to, to light damage. And the damage for those that are not familiar with this, um, there's a diagnostic kind of notching um, pattern that happens um, as the beetle um, uh, damages the, the developing frond and then it unfurls and you, and you get a, a, a missing part of the frondlets uh, that are coming. Um, they have been receiving uh, some technical assistance from, from both ag research. Um, Dr. Bob McFarlane uh, was formerly with the Solomon Islands uh, Ministry of Agriculture. Um, and, but uh, he has also provided some assistance to them, Pamela George from Radar Australia, um, and the SPC uh, team is, is working with them closely as well um, in terms of um, uh, rolling out some of the management options that I've I, uh, discussed previously. Um, and, and together we're, we're um, uh, ag research. Um, Bob, Radar, and SPC are, are trying to give them um, trying to help them design their eradication program to make the most of it. Um, they've also been, um, have recently received, well, uh, some funding to purchase two vehicles um, that they're going to, going to need. Vehicles are always an issue. <laughs> um, and uh, their challenges. Uh, um, and they, they wanted just to share the challenge, some of the challenges that they have had. Um, Obviously, COVID has affected us all, and um, with their borders being closed, um, it's been, and I'm sure this is not unique to, to their situation either. Um, we've all experienced it. Closed borders means it's difficult to bring people in on the ground to be able to assist you. And in the case of, of Vanuatu, um, actually getting on the ground um, training and whatnot has been um, much more difficult because nobody's allowed to travel. But uh, SPC and Ag Research are working on uh, trying to assist them with that um, through some re remote programs that we're initiating. Um, as I said, there is still more training required, um, but they are beginning to release or they have been releasing metarhizium fungus um, and they are um, testing some of the virus uh, to make sure that they can establish infection. And the idea behind this is uh, for a later release. Um, so in the meantime, they're relying on heavily on sanitation um, together with um, targeted metarhizium applications. Um, and they've also found the process of uh, receiving or securing outside um, funding to uh, resources to help them um, a little more lengthy than they had originally anticipated. Um, and again, I think this is quite a common theme throughout the Pacific um, for these sorts of emergency type situations when pests invade. Um, it does take a while to, um, to put together proposals that uh, donors are, are willing and able to fund. Um, um, but uh, yeah, hope, hopefully um, as a group within the CRB community, we'll be able to uh, provide some assistance uh, with putting some of these proposals together. And I think, yeah, and that was the final slide. Yeah. 
So I'm not sure. I'll, I'll, I'll just ask if anybody from Vanuatu is on the call. Um, if, if you have anything to further to contribute, please, um, please speak up and I'll, um, otherwise, if anybody has any other questions, I can try and answer them, um, but write them down and we'll. Okay, we've got a, a couple of questions which I'll deal with, but um, first of all, though, I was surprised and I would like to um, give uh, my sympathy and I'm sure all of our sympathy to SPC and the family of um, Unese, as, uh, that, um, Unese, who was working on this project, has um, sadly, sadly passed away. Una. Um, yes. yes, I apologize. And, uh, I forgot that. Yeah. She was um, a very good colleague of ours and uh, always a, a very cheerful face. So um, it's a very sad, sad event. Um, but I'm sure everybody would like us to solve this CRB problem as well as we can. The questions from uh, one from Tekatay, I'll put these to, to Sean. Um, any idea of how the CRB got to onto New Caledonia and Vanuatu? Um, I can't comment on Vanu um, sorry on New Caledonia. I'll leave that for a Lodi, but in Vanuatu, um, um, they've they had some major road work, so I'll just go back up to um, to improve their roading infrastructure on Afate. And my understanding from what I've been told is a, a boat uh, that um, um, was allowed, was able to um, dock itself somewhere, somewhere in this area here off the, off the coast. Um, and this boat was containing materials um, required for the, the raw materials required for the roading. And at the moment, um, the Sony has told me that's their best guess is that perhaps because the boat originally or originated or passed through um, Papua New Guinea and down through um, Solomon Islands and some other places that it may have um, picked up um, uh, the beetle in that respect, and then it was able to reach the shore, fly fly ashore. But I, um, but that's speculation, and I, uh, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd hate to start a diplomatic row. <laughs> um, but that that's the the best guess that um, biosecurity Vanuatu has told me that that that's how it's got in. But um, but Port Vila itself is a busy port, and uh, it may have it's possible that it got in there. But the fact that there is this boat anchored off the coast near this village, um, Mangalulu, um, does suggest that that's, that's how it happened. Um, Elodie, do you have any comment to make on uh, the, um, for New Caledonia? Yeah, for New Caledonia, we not have uh, one response. Uh, there's no one answer. We have theory uh, and we uh, think uh, what was possible uh, in 2019 uh, because it was around uh, the airport. But when we had the uh, identification of uh, CRBG, we can conclude that uh, there's less probably uh, not come from aircraft because we don't have any link, uh, direct link with um, countries uh, infected by this uh, biotip type. So it's not impossible, but we normally, the commercial uh, link are not uh, going in this, uh, these countries. Uh, the other option is uh, a fraud. I don't know if it's a good word uh, in English, but uh, uh, for the um, where we found the first nest in uh, the nursery uh, palm trees, is not impossible that uh, high risk material could be come in uh, the nursery uh, without any uh, control from us that they they hide something uh, from uh, southeast Asia where is uh, the the beetle is coming from. So we, we are not sure about anything, uh, but uh, it's probably something like that. Hmm. I mean, we don't have any proof. <laughs> yes. 
Okay, thank you, Elodie. That's 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 good, and um, I'm sure we'll have lots more to discuss about these yes. these things. One other question from Madoka um, uh, to you, Sean. Um, which strain of virus will be used in Vanuatu? Uh, they're looking at um, one from Papua New Guinea, um, from uh, from the Papua New Guinea source, uh, because it does seem to match the Papua New Guinea. Um, the, the beetle itself matches up with um, what's been Papua New Guinea, and there is virus circulating within the similar uh, strain of beetle uh, from Papua New Guinea. Okay. So that's what they're testing, yes. But there will be a couple of others um, that, that they may wish to test as well. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Um, okay, is Alfred on the call? Or anybody else from KIK Papua New Guinea? I'm sorry, Sean, I have to pass the ball back to you. Oh, yes, I'll just do a quick search here. No, he's not there. OK, all right. No, that's fine. <laughs> uh, just bear with me. Full screen mode, sharing again. Right. OK, so hopefully this is this is appearing on everybody's screens. Um, so uh, so this was provided to me by um, Aramis. Um, and, and Alfred from the KIK Institute in Papua New Guinea and uh, the KIK is the Coconut Institute, uh, Coconut Corporation uh, that looks after the coconut um, field there. But they're also working with Nakia, who is the biosecurity team, more or less, um, and as well as um, uh, PNG Oprah, which is the oil palm industry uh, body uh, present in Papua New Guinea. And this map here, uh, just summarizes places where they have found coconut rhinoceros beetle. Now I was just talking about or mentioning about Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea in the um, around World War II uh, and slightly after um, received, uh, was originally invaded by the, um, a CRBS version, the susceptible version um, that where virus was able to um, infect these and maintain um, maintain a, a manageable level of, of control. Uh, and it was um, found in New Britain, New Ireland and Manus Islands. And there may be some other outer islands, but um, those were the main islands. Um, and there was no reports of coconut rhinoceros beetle from that time, the 1940s um, in Bougainville or uh, the main New Guinea Island itself. Now in, in 2009, in Port Moresby, coconut rhinoceros beetle was identified as or detected as being present there, um, but at the time, um, no, there was no samples actually uh, collected from that, so we're not sure what it was. But in 2015, it was confirmed that um, CRBG was present together with CRBS um, in the Port Moresby area. Um, now I. Um, what else did you want me to say? Sorry, I'm just looking at some notes. Um, so at this time, um, so so the present day situation is that it, it is it has spread um, from or coconut rhinoceros beetle has now spread through um, several provinces within um, the uh, the New Guinea Island, um, and it's also been found in the autonomous region of uh, Bougainville as well, which is here. And just for those of you uh, who may not be as familiar, um, the Solomon Islands is just um, located in this par part here. Now, um, what I can say um, is that in 2015 or 2016, a bit of a, a survey was done um, out from Port Moresby, and at this time, um, there was some, um, th there was coconut rhinoceros beetle damage identified from um, along parts of the eastern, uh, sorry, western coast of, of the central province. Um, and in 2018 or 19, um, a follow up survey was done, and it was found that it had actually extended its reach 
um, up to about here into the Gulf province um, and a little bit further um, south as well. And this stretch here um, was sort of a mixture of, of what was believed to be S and it is now all, all G with no virus being detected. Um, in the in and around the Ley area in Morobi, there's a, um, a valley that, that has CRBS. Um, and in Madang, um, there's a mixture of CRBG and, and S um, present. And um, so I think I'll leave it, leave that there. Um, but just, oh, uh, actually, the, no, I won't leave it there. Um, the island of Bougainville, or the autonomous region of Bougainville, um, CRB has been detected there uh, recently, and uh, it appears to be S um, as well. Um, so, so G has appears to have um, established itself or, or come in through Port Moresby and then perhaps has spread through, through other, to other areas. That's a little bit of speculation, but that seems to be the most likely um, thing that's happened. Now, in terms of ongoing activities, um, there's a, a, an awareness program that includes um, posters, brochures, and billboards, um, some of the uh, more traditional media of, of of radio and TV as well. And they're also targeting um, um, uh, communi commu local community villages and whatnot um, through, through gatherings and meetings. Um, they are undertaking monitoring and surveillance. So in the Madang province, they're doing this uh, twice a year where they're doing a, a sweep of the, the areas um, that it's known in. In Milne Bay, Central Province and Gulf Provinces, it was 2019. Um, that they are that they're doing this monitoring, uh, and this is kind of an ongoing program that they're they're doing. In terms of a countrywide surveillance um, for coconut rhinoceros beetle, Nakia um, has for a long time been taking care of this. It, it was um, focused primarily in the outer provinces, uh, out, um, but obviously more recently uh, they're starting to look at um, the main New Guinea island as well. Um, and this is also involves uh, the PNG Oprah um, group as well, um, because they've got some substantial um, plantations around there too, as well as KIK. So the commercial industries um, are, are um, assisting them with this. Um, they're using uh, the PVC pipe traps, um, pheromone traps, um, uh, to do their monitoring, um, and as well as um, they're trying mass trapping, but. Um, but that's in uh, the Madang, Morobi, and, and Central Gulf provinces, um, as well, uh, and sanitation. Um, so they've also kickstarted some sanitation to clean up uh, as many breeding sites as they're able to find. Um, at the moment, um, they've had a an intensive 13-week program that's uh, in this in this village here as a as an example. Um, it's considered to be a hotspot. Uh, covers 65 hectares, and they've been collecting specimens and recording um, their observations. Um, and they've destroyed um, quite a few sites, over 7,000 sites. Um, it's cost, uh, so far it's cost about 30,000 US dollars, um, according to what they've got here. Um, and they're looking at other, um, they're looking at other provinces to be able to, um, to target as well. Um, with with some on, ongoing sanitation programs, but some of this um, some of this is still being rolled out, um, and that's that's all the information I have from them for the update. Um, but I, I would like to say that they are working. Um, uh, Nakia, KIK, and PNG Opera are working with um, SPC and Ag Research as part of the um, MFAT uh, Regional CRVG program. Um, and so we'll be providing some more assistance to them. And um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that and ask if anybody has any questions. And if anybody from PNG is present, uh, please feel free to, um, to add anything that I may have um, missed or glossed over. There's a question from Carmel Pilotti, <laughs> and um, I see Kyvan says no, um, and um, but certainly 
we had um, around the um, Port Moresby and Gulf, around the Port Moresby area, uh, we had only, um, we had CRBS, uh, a small population, and then the first um, ingress of, uh, of CRBG. Uh, all of the samples that we find along that southern coast now are CRBG. So, um, that's something, but, to, first of all. Can, I'll come back to you, Kevin, at the end of the section and, and you can um, explain your question. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, Solomon Islands, do we have anybody to report? No, I was asked again <laughs> um, just recently to pre present on their behalf. But um, yes, but if anybody from the Solomon Islands is is on the call, um, I think there was a clashing meeting with, with them. But, um, if not, I will uh, bring up. Um, so I, I didn't receive anything in time, so I'm just using a map that was um, provide or that was created um, in December um, to explain the situation there. Um, so in in the Solomon Islands in 2015, there was a population um, identified of coconut rhinoceros beetle identified in Honiara, um, and it and over time it had spread out from there, um, and um, since then. Um, coconut rhinoceros beetle has been, uh, has been um, found in several other islands um, far from Guadalcanal. Um, and there was, interestingly, there was a population that was found in Western province, um, initially identified in Shortlands. Um, and anecdotal um, information suggests that um, it may have been there for actually quite a long time. Um, and it this was identified as, again, the clade two from a uh, population that matches with um, Papua New Guinea and, as I said before, with, with Vanuatu. Here, um, the original identification in Honiara in 2015 um, was all CRBG. Um, and, but since then, um, it has been found that there, there's a mixed population over time. So 2015, it really was all CR, um, CRBG. And then over time, the present day situation is in and around the Honiara area. Uh, there seems to be um, an introduction or invasion, I guess I'll call it, of CRBS um, that is also joined into that area. Um, and what we do know is that uh, it has that coconut rhinoceros beetle has spread to other nearby islands and some uh, further flung islands uh, as well. Now, um, the Ministry of, of Agriculture in Solomon Islands, they have, um, uh, they have just re recently um, finished signing up a contract with um, uh, the New Zealand Ministry of um, Foreign Affairs and Trade through the New Zealand Aid Program uh, to get gain assistance with uh, sanitation, so that's cleanup, um, but SPC and Ag Research and others have been working um, with them to provide Solomon Islands with, with further information and also on the ground assistance um, for aspects of the, um, the management program that they do want to, um, that, well, that, that, that's being implemented now in the country. Um, and I know that they would also say, similar to Vanuatu, in terms of challenges that, um, yes, it's, it's taken much longer um, than they had originally anticipated to be able to secure funding, um, to, to be able to resource, to be able to provide the resources at a level um, that they can use to roll out across the whole country. Originally, it was found in just a small area, but since then it has actually um, ex uh, quickly spread um, from that. Um, and I think, yeah, and so, so I'll, I'll leave it there for any questions, if anybody has any, because I'm conscious that we need to get onto uh, the northern parts of the Pacific as well. I think the, the main question is from Kyvan, uh, which is saying that the um, haplotyping 
and, and I think there are two, two questions there. One was a statement that the haplotype uh, doesn't reflect phenotypic characteristics, and we agree with you entirely on that. Um, but also the other statement was that haplotyping is useless, which is quite a controversial statement, seeing that um, many uh, invasive insect pests have uh, been following of those invasions, and even well, the human genome is, is based on um, haplotyping. So um, I'd uh, invite you really to um, not at this moment, because I'm sure it will take more than the two or three minutes that are available, uh, but to circulate for, for the group um, an explanation of why you think that haplotyping is, is useless in this situation. Is that okay, Kevin? Yeah, sure, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Can I just co comment uh, uh, on, on the Guadalcanal uh, map? I see uh, viruses mentioned as being identified in uh, uh, COBG and S in Malata and uh, and um, the uh, uh, Honiara area. So uh, that that seems to indicate that some forms of virus are already there, according to the map here. Is yeah, that we don't, correct? Um, yes, and we don't have time to go into all all of it. We could perhaps um, say that for later. But um, um, virus has been in uh, several isolates of virus had been or and have been imported into Solomon Islands for testing um, in the in the lab um, in in the biosecurity lab at uh, Henderson. Um, and there's yeah. Um, and it, it would appear that there has been some accidental um, um, escape from that. But um, yeah, there, there are some nuances around that that are difficult to explain. Just to okay, so that could, could, could it mean that there, there was a virus in the, in the CRBG and S beetles when they first got into the Solomon Islands? There's still that possibility then. Is, is that, um, uh, is that remote, so? But we, remote, but we didn't detect that um, through any of the, um, I think Jeff, in all of in all of our um, early collections, and in all of our um, uh, collections of pure G um, uh, populations, there is no virus. So my view is that the presence of um, virus in in of, of virus positive G samples is possibly um, cross-contamination where the two are, are coexisting, or else it could be, as Kaivan has raised, it could be crosses of the um, of the beetles. But um, we'll sort that out in time. Okay, we, I'm sorry we can't spend longer on the South Pacific because we've got to get the North Pacific, and we've got to get the um, science presentations as well coming through. So. Uh, so, Aubrey, can you come in now? Yeah, by all means. Uh, so north of the equator, there are four island groups that are impacted by coconut rhinoceros beetle. Uh, they're Palau, Japan, Mariana, Mariana Islands, which includes Guam and Rota, the island to the north of us, and then Oahu, and it's only on one island, Oahu, I mean, Hawaii, state on the island of Oahu. So uh, can somebody talk a little bit about Palau? Chris, can you do that? Unmute. Um, sure. There's nothing really new that's been going on in Palau, unless Jack has been doing something. Uh, we're just doing physical trapping and um, uh, we've been working with Madoka up in and Shin up in Japan to try to get um, some of the uh, the samples that of the CRBG with virus. We just identified a few of them and used uh, physical gut mashing and uh, introduction into the beetles down in uh, Sonsoro. And having been back down to review the data and with the government change, it's been a, a bit of a, a difficult time getting down there, but we're hoping to go by the end of the year. 
Um, our main focus has been up on one of the uh, northern atolls of Kayal um, for uh, green waste management and uh, net trapping with the uh, pheromones that uh, Roland gave me in large quantities. Thanks, Roland. Um, so that's where we are now, and we're developing a report for the new the new president on invasive species management with uh, the Nature Conservancy, and hopefully we can get um, uh, a molecular genomics lab running, which would be fun. Got hey, it. Chris. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Palau is a little different from the other islands in the north in that it um, it ha has had CRBS for a long time, probably before the Second World War. And then uh, quite recently, about the same time that Guam was invaded by CRBG, they got CRBG as well. Okay, the, the next island group would be Japan. Uh, CRBG is in Okinawa and the Ryukyu Islands. And from what I understand, it's not causing a lot of problems there, which makes it very interesting. So Madoka, can you chime in on that, please? May I talk about only in Japan? Do you mean only in Okinawa or in Japan? Not in, about Palau. Do you well, want you can talk about the work you've been doing with Chris in Palau as well, sure. Okay. okay. So uh, what we have done so far is we are using the Japanese beetle that was ident identified as a CRVG and uh, some serine we use in Japanese, you know, insect serine. And uh, we isolated uh, uh, CRV, I'm sorry, uh, viruses from Parao, and that is the new viruses, and we characterize and fully sequence that, you know, the full sequence we have done and compared to the, uh, that is the X2B isolate, that is common biological control agent that was sent from AG research in New Zealand. And uh, that is very similar, uh, very similar viruses, as well as other Solomon Island one as well, I think. But uh, uh, so we are going to publish the data and with Chris and, and now I'm inviting to Mike Metzler in Hawaii, his student also working on, in Palau, and we want to involve that data. And I'm asking to Mike to you know, join with our paper. And that is what we have done so far. And in Japan, CRB is not pest because we don't have a palm, but we have a lot of CRB in Okinawa. But very, very interesting, that is not pest at all. Thank you, Madoka. For Guam, Glenn Dulla from the Department of Agriculture has offered to report. You there, Glenn? Yeah, I'm here, Aubrey. Go ahead. All right, thank you guys. Um, so on Guam, there are three primary entities that work on CRBG. Um, it is the Guam Department of Agriculture, the University of Guam, and also the Department of Defense. Uh, through Colorado, through Colorado State University, who are their contractors. And all three of us have, uh, I'm gonna read off uh, uh, progress or updates from each one of them. Um, so I'll start with the University of Guam um, with Aubrey's projects. Uh, so the automated roadside video surveys of CRB damage, um, they have completed their third bi-monthly automated roadside survey videos of CRB damage on Guam. And now they are, they have sent the same equipment to Rhoda and successfully um, done roadside surveys in Rhoda as well. Um, on the harmonic radar project, um, Ari is preparing for a field trial on Guam to test the feasibility of using harmonic radar tags attached to CRB adults to detect CRB breeding sites. Um, this is a follow-up to previous work where they successfully discovered cryptic breeding sites by locating miniature radio transmitters attached to adults. Uh, the advantage of using harmonic radar is that the tags are smaller, lighter, and have an unlimited shelf life and field life in contrast to the radio transmitters, which have a shelf life of a few months and a field life of a few days. Um, additionally, the harmonic radar tags are about a, a dollar 
uh, they cost about a dollar as opposed to the radio transmitters, uh, which are about $200. Uh, and then uh, headed by Dr. Jim Grisella, the Insect Pathology Lab um, was established. Um, the focus of the lab is on running lab bioassays for CRB, nudivirus isolates uh, to find candidates for effective biocontrol. Uh, there have been problems with variables, sometimes high mortality in experimental control groups, and are current, they're currently rethinking their methodology. Um, use of field collected CRB adults uh, test insects, and they would like to switch to standardized laboratory reared adults of known age. Uh, they are also considering sourcing these insects from the from University of Hawaii rather than reestablishing their own colony. Um, they plan to extend our bio, their bioassay observations beyond mortality as a single endpoint to include fecundity. Um, also, Dr. Grisella has made progress in establishing a CRB cell culture, uh, which might be useful in propagating new nudivirus. On the Department of Defense side, um, which primarily focuses on interdiction and management. Um, their updates are, um, they have established a network of 287 um, black panel CRB traps, uh, which were deployed at the mili military installations on Guam in August, two, August 2020. Uh, 144 traps at Anderson Air Force Base and 143 at Naval Base Guam. Um, almost 4,000 adults were captured and euthanized between August and December. Trapping continues and plans to expand the trap network are being discussed. They are also conducting surveys of dead palms and green waste in the military installations. And this data will be used to remove breeding sites across the bases. And there are future plans for DOD properties, including the lands leased in the Northern Marianas, uh, which will include pal palm damage surveys. Um, yeah. And then for my section, the local side, Department of Agriculture, Guam, um, again, we focus, since CRBG is pretty much established and all over Guam, there's nowhere that there is no CRB. Uh, we focus also on uh, biosecurity measures to hopefully prevent uh, CRBG from egressing out of Guam to the other islands, because we are the source point for the rota infestation and also, well, I don't know for sure, but most likely we are the source point for the Hawaii infestation as well. Um, so the Department of Agriculture um, runs a network of CRB panel traps around the ports of entry, both the seaport and the airport and all their associated um, properties. Uh, we've recently uh, removed over 200 dead palms um, and other green waste um, sites, which um, we found that almost all of them were breeding sites. And these are just around the ports of entry, uh, which makes them high risk. Uh, we've also completed damage surveys of all the palm trees around the ports of entry. Um, and this is just to, to establish baseline uh, data uh, for any future management work um, that we do conduct um, to see if we're making a difference. And then future work, um, the USDA has granted us, USDA APHIS has granted us a small grant um, to uh, propagate and culture the metarhizium fungus and then to use that as a treatment for cryptic breeding sites that we can't get to around the ports of entry. Uh, currently, uh, we're still well, well, working on federal permits to allow us to release this biocontrol. Um, and that's it for myself. Um, Aubrey's here for the university and so is Roland. And then Dr. Pulio Fico is here from Colorado State. And if you have any questions specifically for their projects, um, feel free to address them directly. Thanks, Len. Okay, is anybody here from Rota? 
If not, I'll just say a few words on Rota. So Rota is the island which is directly north of Guam. It's about 35 miles off our coast. Uh, they were infested with coconut rhinoceros beetle about three years ago. And since then, they've been um, trying to eradicate it. Uh, they recently got a large grant from uh, Department of the Interior Office of Insular Affairs, uh, $250,000 US. And just a few weeks ago, uh, Office of Insular Affairs had a, um, a webinar similar to this one to discuss the problem on Rota. And that was recorded and it's going to be turned into a podcast. And I'll send out the address to everybody when that is published. So uh, the next island group is Hawaii. Is there anybody uh, online who's willing to talk about Hawaii? Uh, I can talk about Hawaii or if Mike uh, has something prepared um, either way, if Mike is on. It's all you, Keith. Okay, so let me, uh, let me just share my screen here and all right, let me go into presentation mode real quick. All right. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. No. All right. Um, okay, why is this not going? We can see there it. We go. You can see it now? Yeah. Oh, okay, so um, yeah, so I'm going to keep this pretty quick. Um, so just to give you an idea of where we are in terms of uh, the numbers that we've been finding, um, we've been finding since 2014, and there were significant populations at that point. So uh, CRB has probably been in Hawaii uh, since maybe as early as 2010 or, or, or earlier than that. Uh, and you can see we've got kind of an upward trend in fines, uh, which is disturbing to us. Uh, if we look at the annual totals, we've we've got a, a, a pretty steep upward trend. So that that that's definitely um, sort of bad looking. But um, the mitigating factor we have uh, populations. The original area of infestation is over near the airport. If people can see my cursor moving here on the south part of the island near Pearl Harbor, uh, they're mostly gone from that area. Um, our, our work was pretty su successful over there. So there's, there's um, not major populations there, but we do have two really major population centers uh, here in our Pearl City Peninsula area and our Iroquois Point area. And I'll tell you about some of the work we've been doing recently at Iroquois Point later uh, in this update. And then um, we've got this blue area is just kind of um, lower level detections. And so um, these this uh, central populations we have here in this area, Mililani and Kunia are some of our bigger concerns, but don't account for very much of the population. Uh, so we, we've defined some critical management zones for us based on where we find most of the um, CRB in Hawaii. So there's a lot of information on here, but the most important thing um, to take away is these are our critical areas, this Pearl City Peninsula, YPO Peninsula, Iroquois Point, and Mililani in, in the green here. And between those four locations, um, it's, it's the majority of the CRB that are found on Oahu. So sort of this south central swath here is um, about 80% of the beetles that we find, I believe. So, all uh, right. Um, so those of you who receive, receive our situation reports, we, we, we um, prepare weekly reports of uh, all of our catch data and also some of the other programs that we have, we have like our, our canines, we talk about breeding sites and outreach and all the, all the kinds of things that we're doing out here. Um, and uh, we do have some outlying hits that I wanna show you on here. So we've definitely got some finds on the West Coast um, and there's a big mountain range here that kind of isolates the West Coast from this more central region. And then there's another big mountain range that runs this way. So um, that's a little bit of an insulator for these. So we're most worried about movement up this direction and then around the coast here or down and around this way. Um, uh, over, so on the North shore of Oahu here, we've had, we found one beetle there. Uh, we found one beetle on a Marine Corps base uh, on the windward side over here. And we found three over here. So, so we do have some human vector transport to some of the more problematic parts of the island. But as far as we can tell, none of those have uh, resulted in 
established breeding populations in those areas. Uh, we've recently had some, uh, what appears to be some success with uh, pesticide injections into palms using imidacloprid products. Um, so here you can see our latest set of injections. These are around a thousand trees that were injected in a um, housing area, a manicured housing area that um, belongs to uh, the Navy, but is, is anybody can live there. Uh, and it's kind of scrub around there. This is a drier scrub area. And then most, almost all of the palm trees are located in this housing area. So it was a good um, sort of test case for us, not experimental, but test case, where we've got a little bit of an island of palm trees here that, and, we, and we injected almost all the palm trees in the area. So um, what we expect in terms of time, this is, this is very speculative, but what we sort of um, expect is when we do the initial injections, so um, we've got a timeline here, there's going to be a period of time where that um, pesticide is translocating up into the crowns of the trees. Once it translocates into the crown of the trees, then adults will start to die and we'll see declines in the populations. Um, while the adults are dying, they're going to be laying fewer eggs. So progressively over this period, as new CRB emerge, the number of CRB inbreeding sites should be decreasing because the number of adults laying eggs should be decreasing as well. So this decline in adults is going to eventually lead to a decline in the um, breeding populations. And that should be sort of a lagging. Uh, we're, we're currently not 100% sure of what this lethal threshold is, but some unpublished recent work that uh, Dr. Cheng's group has been doing, they've, they've taken some of the affected fronds and um, put CRB in with them. And the, the CRB um, die with contact from the fronds from these injected trees. Uh, and of course, the lab work that was done with, with just pesticides of, of um, uh, like sugarcane samples that were treated with pesticides, uh, those, those had the same lethal effect. So uh, we are getting some lethal levels in the field. We're just not sure how long those are going to persist. Uh, and so far, we are seeing a decline. So um, here, uh, sorry, this is, I put project weeks because that's just how our data is uh, organized. So I didn't take the time to put actual dates in here, but this is, um, this is from last summer until January of this year. So the injections uh, began on this week 345 uh, and then injections were about 50% complete by 355 and then totally complete by 364. So um, we don't know when the pesticides started to be effective, but just looking at our data, it looks like, you know, when you go from this week where we had over 45 beetles to the week where we had seven beetles, that seems like a good point to choose for. Maybe that's when they started working. So uh, this is, that's an assumption I've made. But if we take the, um, the totals for the 10 weeks before the drop and the 10 weeks after the drop, uh, the average is 20.2 beetles as opposed to 6.4. And this graph is a little bit old. If we look at that 6.4, now for more than 10 weeks, it's probably 15 weeks now. That number is closer to four beetles per week. So looks like we're having a sustained decrease in the populations out there. The other caveat to interpreting the effectiveness of the injections is we also did find some breeding sites in there, primarily stumps of different species, not only coconut stumps and other palm stumps, but uh, stumps of just uh, regular um, deciduous trees that are found in the area. So. Uh, some breeding site finds combined with that injection work, we think are responsible for this um, drop in the population. So uh, of course, it's going to take a little time if we go back to um, this speculation here, just based on the life cycle of the beetle, um, before you see, uh, before all these CRB larvae have emerged, we're not going to see a real huge drop in the adult spine because there's always new ones coming out of the breeding sites, going into traps. Um, that haven't fed on uh, that haven't fed on trees presumably. So uh, until until we get through the life cycle of an egg laid in the soil becoming an adult, we don't expect to get rid of um, have our numbers go down completely. So we've still got probably three or four months before we see a maximal effect. Um, just in, uh, what we anticipate from projections. So um, that's what I wanted to share. I can answer any questions about any other um, specifics about what we're seeing in, uh, in Hawaii uh, later. 
I hope I haven't taken too much time. Thanks. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, so that's it for islands north of the Pacific. Um, so I think we need to move on at this point. Yeah, how do I? Back to you, Trevor. Yep. OK. Um, thank you. Thank you, Keith, for that presentation and the rest of the, the Northern Group led by, uh, <laughs> introduced by Aubrey. Um, and I think um, there are some some interesting things to to share in there, particularly the um, uh, the trunk injection. So um, it's uh, uh, something that um, Lastus is going to bring up as well from an, a different different perspective. So um, I think the time is now quarter past three. We are due to finish at four. As we started a little bit late, I'm happy to take it till. Um, uh, quarter past four, but I don't think um, when everybody starts to drift off after that. So um, that gives us an hour to look at the science presentations and then um, to have some discussion if we've got um, time for it. So our first science pre presentation is from Kataio Sagata and um, looking at the IPM options in oil palm in, in PNG. Is Kat Katayo here? Or Mark, did you have any? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Yep. Yes. Katayo. Yep. Katayo. Yep. yep. We've got you. Um, Keith, if you just. Um... Move your mouse all the way to the top. Yep, there you go. <laughs> okay, Kata, welcome. <laughs> uh, so, do we? Uh, what can I see the presentation? I can't see the presentation. For the at the top of the screen, um, you should have. Ah, no, at the bottom. <laughs> so at the bottom of the screen for me, there's a green button that says share screen. Oh, at the bottom, okay, I see. Yep. And then you just have to choose the screen or the window uh, that you'd like to present. Ah, very good. I... So you have to show the screen with your presentation, which will, is it PowerPoint or in? Ah, um... uh, okay. I'll... I have the PowerPoint in other uh, presentation uh, computer and I'm using someone else because I don't have uh, internet in my laptop. So uh, if I can be postponed to maybe another talk, I can go and bring my uh, talk. Okay, well, let's um, move on to the, the second one. and We'll come back to you, Katao, in um, probably in about 30 minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mark, can you are you able to um, present on the evaluation of CRBG pheromone? Yes, I can be able to do that, Trevor. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. I can't see your screen. Okay, I'll go to shift. So, Katayo, you might need to close your yeah, eyes. Okay.
If you've got the presentation on your on your laptop as a PowerPoint mark, you need to yes. get that onto the screen and then press the share screen button. That's right. I've got it on. For some reason, I can't get it onto the. Maybe we could move on for now to, to Sulav. Would you be able to present yours, Sulav? Sure, sure. And then sure. we'll come back to the PNG ones. Sure. Let me see my screen first. Right, I'd like to um, introduce Sulav to the, the group. He's a, a new member of our team. And well, not so new, but he's been working from Nepal and uh, has been finally able to enter New Zealand and at the moment is in a hotel room in Auckland, but um, within a week or so we'll be down with us at, at Lincoln. So I'll hand over to Sulav. Sure. Okay, so can you see my screen, Trevor? Yes, yep, coming through. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Trevor, and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to briefly talk about, you know, our recently published paper on biological control of CRV in the coconut rhinoceros beetle in the Pacific. So um, to start with a bit of background, so you know the history of biological control of CRV in the Pacific dates back to early 1900. Uh, just to recap, you know, um, a CRV was accidentally introduced into the uh, Pacific uh, in 1909. And it was um, 1913, you know, when the first use of biological control agent like metrazium were reported against CRB uh, from Western Samoa. And then during 1950s and 1960s, there was a massive you know, campaign to test and introduce different uh, biological control agents against CRB, uh, mostly you know through funding from international development agencies and um, administered through SPC. Uh, in 1963, um, German scientist Alice Huger was the first one to detect you know a viral disease called as Oryzes rhinoceros nudivirus in short ORNV uh, from Malaysia, and um, it was 1967 when the first pilot release of ORNV uh, in Western Samoa was conducted and subsequently, you know, it was then in other surrounding um, nations as well as territories. Uh, ORNV was, you know, so successful in managing, you know, CRB population um, in the Pacific during then that, you know, there were no any, you know, reports of further spread to new areas for almost more than 30 to 40 years. Uh, but uh, in, as we all know, in 2007, um, a new wave of CRV invasion uh, in the Pacific was noted, first from Guam and subsequently from other surrounding nations and territories. And here we are in 2021, still kind of like trying to find a solution for this uh, big, huge problem uh, that you know that the farmers from the Pacific island are facing right now. So again, that background, uh, the overall objective of our review was to basically, you know, collect information on all the past biological control efforts and analyze their successes and failures. And at the meantime, kind of present, uh, uh, present a framework or some ideas on how best, you know, we can integrate biocontrol agent to um, basically manage the new wave of CRV invasion. So, which is uh, which is believed to be, you know, because of a new uh, uh, new variant of CRB called as CRVZ, and which are apparently, you know, tolerant to uh, the commonly used um, ORNV isolates. 
So our result, you know, um, from the published literature, we were able to, you know, put together a list of uh, around 80 species, uh, which were reported as, you know, putative natural enemies from, you know, all around the globe, from Southern Southeast Asia, Africa, Oceania, you know, Americas and Europe. So we have the full list, uh, full list of you know, natural enemies in our paper. So I'm not gonna uh, just talk about a um, lot about this. And just to give you a few examples. So in the, in the top of the list, we have Oryces rhinoceros univirus, ORNB, which is considered as one of the landmark, you know, uh, example of classical biological control, uh, which is still very, you know, effective against CRB, CRB and is still widely used. Uh, second, uh, metrism complex, uh, primarily metrism anisoplay and metrism mazes, which are commonly used in breeding site, uh, mostly in, you know, in the native range of South and Southeast Asia. Um, apart from the, these two, you know, there were a lot of other biocontrol agents which were you know, tested and uh, introduced during the 1950s and 60s and so on uh, in the Pacific, but, you know, were largely unsuccessful, you know, some of them were, you know, uh, predatory beetles, notably, you know, illiterates, hysterias, whereas some uh, parasitoids like uh, scholars as well as some ectoparasites like mites. But again, you know, most of them were uh, largely unsuccessful for various reasons. Uh, first, you know, uh, the majority of them, they were unable to adapt to the Pacific environment. Uh, second, some of them, uh, in fact, were unable to you know, adapt to the CRB host for various reasons. Uh, third, a few of them kind of were, you know, eaten by the local natural enemies. Uh, therefore, you know, very few of those introduced species actually um, were, were, were established, in, uh, were reportedly established in the Pacific. But unfortunately, you know, um, there were not much follow-up studies um, done regarding those species, so we didn't know much about, you know, those, um, those um, species which were reportedly established in the Pacific. So, Next, new wave, managing the new wave of CRV invasions, future direction. At the end of the paper, we basically, you know, present our viewpoint and present some ideas on, you know, what, what could be some of the future research directions which could help to find us a viable solution of this, you know, new emerging threat of CRBZ. So first, uh, because in the past, uh, you know, ORNV as well as metasium were the uh, two most potent uh, biocontrol agents against um, CRV, so we believe that, you know, variants of these two internal pathogens are the most likely candidates. And, you know, um, we should focus on investigating them, you know, in the native range, in the center of origin, which, which is our best bet. There has already been, you know, some good results coming out of uh, Solomon Island, you know, where they found that local isolates uh, imported from Philippines uh, were effective against um, CRBZ. So, some, some good hope there. Second, um, I think knowledge about the genetic diversity as well as virulence of ORNB from different geographical locations will be very important to basically uh, develop and implement a site specific um, biocontrol plans. Uh, there has been some ongoing work, but yeah, I think it needs kind of much more attention uh, to, find, you know, to find a good uh, biocontrol program. Third, investigating you know local uh, natural enemies as well as internal pathogens in the invasive range. Uh, there has been this, um, a couple of reports coming out from Hawaii uh, that, where they found that you know local local isolates of uh, metrasium as well as heterohepatitis nematode were effective against CRV. So something something that needs to be followed up on as well. Uh, fourth. Uh, assessment of past introduction, as I mentioned in my earlier slides as well, that you know there has been a um, couple of there has been reports of a couple of species, couple of intro introduced species which are successfully established in the Pacific. But yeah, we don't know much about those species, so it would be good to you know kind of investigate the, the status for what, uh, currently and whether they are you know they are kind of uh, contributing to. Um, CRB control in some ways, so and whether we know we could use them as a part of our uh, conservative as well as augmentative uh, biocontrol program. So yeah, so these are some of the ideas that kind of we have presented in our paper, and uh, we'd be more than happy to you know discuss with you this and anything, anything further. And uh, so with that, so I, I would invite my co-author actually, my co-authors Sarah, Trevor, uh, Laura, and Son, if they want to add something. 
otherwise that's all from now from me okay i'll pass that to trevor okay thank you so love that's um good and i um we'll make sure that the paper is accessible to everybody um in the group and uh, it, we felt it was important and Sulev had the opportunity to to make the review while he was um, away in Nepal and not in the um, in the middle of the zone. But um, there are a lot of questions on um, what other natural enemies could be important. And I think the interesting one of the most interesting things was um, Sulev's first slide, which is the intense damage that was recorded in Samoa in 2013 in that very um, flaky photograph. And, uh, you know, we see the same kind of thing occurring in central Port Moresby. We see the same kind of thing working in central Honiara. Um, and so that, that initial wave of um, infection, of, of uh, invasion being, being very highly, highly damaging. Um, but um, so we have to think about other natural enemies as well. If I could just comment uh, there, Trevor, uh, yep. regarding the releases of Arictis nudivirus, uh, a lot of the releases, uh, as commented in the past, have been on of uh, uh, cultures produced in the Heteronychus aurata African oh, yeah. beetle culture. Uh, and there, there is still a possibility that. Uh, the virus may have evolved over time in culture so that it's become adapted to uh, developing and, and, and attacking cells in culture, but it might gradually uh, have lessened or, or uh, even lost its ability to attack uh, the coconut rhinoceros beetle, which is the actual target. And uh, uh, it will be good to explore genomes of the various strains of Arictis nudivirus to uh, uh, explore whether the, this possibility has happened or, or whether it, whether the Arictis rhinos always always stays the same in uh, tissue culture. I, I think, um, Jeff, it's, uh, yeah, we should be obviously looking at uh, genomic variation in the virus and what we are what we are producing, but the strains that we have used have not um, evolved in culture because they are very close to the original isolations that were were taken of those. They they've been stored for many years, and uh, you know using. Um, the accepted methods of, of storage and um, um, and um, production, uh, they are very close to the original the original isolates that were taken um, in some cases by um, uh, Alan Crawford and, and Paul Scotty. Um, but um, the important thing, of course, you need you need to well check the genomic uh, uh, at the genomic level to. Uh to be uh, sure of that or uh, whether, whether mutations of so, genome changes have crept in. Uh, the only way to know is to check the genomes of uh, but I, these but I think, strains. Uh, yeah, I think, I think it's, good to, it's good to check the, the genomes, but also the key thing that we want is a virus type that is pathogenic to these these new invasive populations, and we only learn that by bioassay. Okay, we'll come back to this if you like at the at the end. We have some more presentations from Katayo, Mark, and, and Lastus to go through, and uh, then we'll come back to the discussion. So, who wants to go first? Are you ready, Mark? Can you? Can I share it again? Yep. Uh, try and log in from yours. That's it. 
Aha. Uh -huh. Very good. Is that okay to everybody now? Yes, good. Thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you, Trevor. And, uh, yeah, good afternoon to everyone once again. Uh, yeah, my presentation this afternoon will basically be on looking at Thermon uh, for CRBG. Uh, in the past uh, yeah, meetings and discussions that we had, uh, there has been questions uh, raised as to whether we've uh, had a look at the Fermont uh, for CRV. And there was some work that we did for the population in the, in the Solomon Islands. So I will be presenting uh, that result. That's uh, the work that was done uh, with my previous uh, employer, uh, PNG Opera. So I just would like to acknowledge uh, the uh, ownership of the data, uh, as well as uh, the permission for me to present the data. Uh, I will basically be presenting uh, this presentation on behalf of the, uh, the current uh, head of entomology there, uh, Dr. Katayu Sagata. And this work was uh, funded by the oil palm industry in PNG, as well as the Solomon Islands, and we did the work uh, when I was there in collaboration with uh, uh, NRI in the UK, uh, with uh, Professor David O and his team. Uh, yeah, just uh, for background, this was the situation uh, in, uh, in, in the Solomon Islands at Gipol at the time we did the study. Uh, we had high population pressure, and that's the kind of uh, damage that was being caused uh, to the oil palm. Uh, so we had uh, very high population of the beetles uh, when the study was conducted. And uh, what basically uh, led us to the study uh, was that there was a low population of CRB that was caught in the pheromone traps, uh, particularly with the experiences from Guam, Hawaii, uh, from Oniara, as well as uh, Port Mosby. And there was a question of uh, its effectiveness against the, uh, the CRPG. Uh, and uh, there was also a suggestion uh, on the possibility of existence of uh, cryptic uh, species. Uh, we could have uh, varied levels of uh, response to uh, the beetle, uh, to the uh, pheromone, the commensal pheromone by different populations. And uh, also, I think there was improvement down to the lure from the initial formulation uh, to the current uh, formulation that has been used. And uh, we thought there would be a need for further investigations. Uh, investigation as uh, the study was conducted. Uh, in terms of the study methodology, uh, what I think was we basically collected the, uh, the CRB uh, pupae uh, from the oil palm establishments within uh, uh, the Solomon Islands uh, with the, uh, yeah, within the cocoon, and uh, we uh, send those up to NRI. Uh, and uh, once it got there, uh, they did the, uh, the chemical studies, uh, uh, they did the, the collection of the volatiles as well as the, the internal response uh, studies. Uh, you see the uh, uh, virgin males and females. And uh, yeah, after the extraction, they had also developed the dispensers 
and also the measurement, uh, the yeah, release rate measurements. Uh, and they formulated uh, two formulations of the film uh, one in the polyethylene vials, and the other as uh, suset uh, dispensers. And that uh, got sent to us uh, for the uh, field studies. And the field work was conducted in the Solomon Islands within the same field where the PPA were collected and sent. Uh, and uh, for the traps, uh, the PVC pipe traps were used. And we did both the single and combination dual trials. Uh, and the trial at uh, nine treatments and six reps uh, that, yeah, that we ran. And just moving on to the results, uh, I won't delve too much in the chemistry because that's not my area, uh, but uh, I'll just uh, yeah, I like what was identified. Uh, there was identification of uh, uh, or the uh, volatiles that were identified from, from comprised of ester and acid uh, that came in the ratio of four is to one. Uh, and uh, they were able to determine the S and uh, R components uh, separated. And the males produce the R component. Uh, the only difference that was uh, identified with the current uh, pheromone that was uh, used was that in that study it was suggested that they produce S, uh, but from the current uh, study it was not that uh, it produced uh, R. Uh, and for the internal response to individual esters, uh, just looking at the R and ester, uh, S esters, uh, there was a strong response uh, to the R ester than the S. Uh, and uh, yeah, looking at the dispensers and the release rate, uh, yeah, it was tested for both uh, formulation uh, uh, and yeah, for the ester uh, in the vial, uh, the release rate uh, was almost uh, about uh, the same as for the acid release rate uh, from the uh, SESET. Uh, whereas for the acid release rate from the SESET, uh, it was quite high, about 20 milligram per day. Uh, at, and those were tested at uh, 22 degrees uh, Celsius for, for the release rate. Uh, and moving on, uh, so what basically had happened was after all those were done in the UK, uh, those were uh, sent back to, to us uh, and uh, they were field tested in the field. Uh, and uh, initially for the, the single load test, yeah, with a trap in to our surprise, and that uh, the standard in the, gra uh, in the graph is referring to the, the orector loop uh, that's currently been used. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it trapped significantly higher number of uh, beetles than the different lures uh, that uh, uh, were formulated and sent to us. Uh, so we sort of from the results that we were getting, uh, we uh, concluded that it could be that the, the trapping was more population dependent uh, than uh, the 
yeah, with regard to the attractiveness of the beetle. So if you add more beetles, uh, then you end up getting more beetles uh, in the traps, uh, then, uh, yeah, then being, uh, more, being attracted more to the, to the traps. So, yeah, we did that, and then when uh, we did the combination lures of the different combinations, uh, the attractiveness uh, was improved. Uh, we did get more uh, beetles in the different combinations, uh, but then that was not uh, significantly different from the 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 the, the standard pheromone uh, that uh, we, uh, that we currently use for the trapping. So with uh, lost results. Uh, what we basically concluded uh, was that the, yeah, the only difference in the law that uh, we came across to the study was the, uh, the difference between the R and S components, uh, where R was more attractive to the beetle. Uh, and yeah, the standard uh, law uh, still tend to be more effective than the new loose, uh, although the, the combinations uh, increase the, the effectiveness of trapping. Uh, and uh, yeah, that sort of uh, led us to think that uh, it was more, the trapping was more population uh, density dependent uh, rather than the attractiveness of the beetle. Uh, and yeah, for us, we didn't go on to look at the different, uh, yeah, the field release rate of the beetle, uh, of, of the of the lures, uh, or the effective range uh, of the of the lures. Uh, we, because we were overwhelmed by the situation, and we wanted to continue with the with the trapping. Uh, we, we concluded that the, uh, the standard uh, law was still more effective, so we opted to uh, use the uh, directed law as part of the management uh, programs, uh, as well as uh, for monitoring. And I think that's basically it, Trevor. Thank you, Mark. That's um, very good. That's a, it's a question that um, people have asked for, um, for some time, uh, over whether the um, uh, population in Honiara or in Guam is less attracted to the lures than um, the, the other populations. And obviously, we haven't um, addressed that side by side. Uh, but what we do know is that the lures are good for, as a monitoring instrument, uh, but not um, not so good as a mass trapping instrument. And I think um, uh, Aubrey would agree with that. And um, there seems to be no simple way of improving the uh, attractiveness of, of the lure. Um, interesting that with the new lures, the slightly more females than um, the males seem to be coming into the traps, which is what we found previously with with most of the, the trapping data. Any comments quickly on pheromones? Uh, yeah, this is Aubrey. Um, yeah, on Guam here, we've, we've measured trapping efficiency by doing uh, mark release recapture experiments. And we've never exceeded more than 10% of beetles recaptured in, in traps. So we abandoned the idea of uh, significant population suppression using trapping a long time ago. Um, they are still useful for monitoring, that's for sure. Yep. And we, we did do a lot of experiments trying to improve the traps, not, not the lure, but the traps. And we were able to improve the trap catch by about an order of magnitude by doing things like putting LED lights on them and uh, you know, reshaping them, that kind of thing. Uh, it's, it's kind of incredible that not a lot of work has been done on trapping of, of rhino beetles. Um, we still don't know the, the effective range of the lures. 
We don't know the active space of the traps, you know, that, that kind of common stuff. And on Guam, we only have experience with CRBG. So everything I say is only CRBG. It is possible that they're not as attractive to uh, Rick Delure as CRBS. But again, we don't have colonies of, of CRBG and CRBS so that we can do comparative bioassays looking at uh, attractiveness to semiochemicals. And we really need to, to get those colonies going, I think, so we can do some decent science. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks, Aubrey. Um, time's, time's moving on. So um, is Lestus with us? Lestus, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Ah, yes, good. I am here. Can we hear from Mr. you? Your, your presentation Let's on the... Uh, um, is this appearing on the screens? No, no. Let me try again. The share screen button at the bottom of my, my program. Yeah. <coughs> Is yep. it there now? Coming, coming through now. Yes, here we are. We've got it now, Lastus. Thank you. Okay, there are plenty of slides, but I will go through them very quickly. Uh, my name is Lastus. I'm the head of research and development here at Ramu Agri Industries, uh, also part of uh, New Britain Palm Oil. I'm going to uh, talk about the uh, insecticide work that uh, we have been doing in Solomon. So, and this is Although I had my name here, but it's Craig Gibson and uh, Alfred Pocona contributed uh, a lot to this work. <clears throat> uh, I think basically what we were looking for is an alternative to carbofuran. Uh, at the time of the outbreak in 2015-17, uh, 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 we had no option but to uh, use carbofuran. But carbofuran is an RSPO and uh, send uh, uh, dirty words. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we're looking for something cheap and most effective. <clears throat> and you all have seen this. This is uh, taken at um, just outside uh, Honiara, coconuts damage, and then they moved into a uh, young oil farm. <clears throat> and they're breeding in the logs uh, and completing the life cycle uh, very successfully. The logs had been uh, <clears throat> there from the uh, felling of the palms for replanting. <clears throat> Once the populations were so big, they uh, so large, they went into the 10 year old uh, palms. And of course they did a lot of damage. And uh, we had to remove a lot of palms uh, to try and uh, stop that uh, developing any further. You can see the beetles are uh, taking uh, <clears throat> fruit and that's now going to be left on the roadside to rot away. We uh, did uh, <clears throat> some trials with artificial uh, breeding sites using old logs. And the second trial uh, was the, to use the uh, fresh material from the cheap uh, oil palm. And these are the insecticides. Imidacloprid is applied as Sascon Maxi and Confido <coughs> compared to the Cabofuran. <coughs> this is <coughs> before the, uh, <coughs> we, we created these sorts of uh, uh, artificial breeding sites and then uh, a couple of months later, we went back and looked for the, uh, uh, since the, uh, the <clears throat> beds are four meters by two meters, uh, we sampled uh, two by two in the first uh, three months, after the three months, and then we went back six months later to do the other half. And <clears throat> populations continue to increase <clears throat> uh, af uh, after six months. But there are, there are some promising things uh, here 
where we reduce populations uh, in the Saskatchewan, Mexico. <clears throat> and this is for total larvae, and especially in the third insta, uh, in the first 90 days, but the populations continue to increase uh, later on. <clears throat> and this is the uh, breeding sites we prepared from those old uh, farms, uh, not the old farms, the farms that we have pulled down because of heavy damage. And then this is at three months later, and then, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, 90 days later, the whole material, fresh material has decomposed. And we had to clear a lot of that, uh, all the uh, legume cover crops were uh, rooting inside the planting uh, the uh, material that has been prepared. <clears throat> and this is very good sign <clears throat> because uh, it tells us quite a lot about the breeding uh, sites. And when we look at the uh, larvae, again, Saskatchewan makes it. <clears throat> the imidacloprid uh, granular formulation seems to uh, be doing something. I think we're getting variable uh, damage, uh, infestations here because by applying the uh, insecticides by hand over the uh, material, breeding site material, it is very difficult to get an even, uh, even distribution. But the results from this is being followed through in a separate trial, uh, which I will be discussing the results later on. <clears throat> now, I also had a look at uh, breeding sites, uh, especially in the old logs away from uh, the trial area, <clears throat> uh, uh, empty fruit bunches and front piles. There's very, very few insects we found on uh, <clears throat> in the front, front piles. So that gives us a lot of confidence that we are not breeding insects. But yes, with the old logs, we are recovering a lot of insects. And those insects that we <clears throat> recover from the breeding sites, the logs and the EFP are very, very big insects. We're talking at up to 120 grams, 18 grams of pupae uh, from uh, empty fruit bunches. And in the front pile, we're dealing with uh, less than six grams uh, larvae. That, that is the weight of, of uh, Ted Insta larvae. Now, Mark discussed the uh, pheromone trapping. This is some of the data. What we have found uh, with pheromone trapping is that in the pheromone traps, we are catching more female beetles. <clears throat> which is a very good sign because we can lure and kill beetles and the subsequent generation will be depressed because we are killing more uh, individual females plus uh, the eggs that they're potentially carrying. Now, there is still question whether those females that come to the pheromone traps, whether they have already deposited their eggs before they come to the pheromone traps or not, that's something for someone else to look at later. Uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> the onset of rains help uh, flush out the beetles, and this will be an uh, indication when we should be putting out our pheromone traps well before the rains come and capitalize on the emergence of beetles. <clears throat> the earlier trials on the breeding sites uh, suggested Cabofuran and Saskan Maxi uh, to be <clears throat> if, uh, to be showing some promise, and we took those through to the next set, uh, set of trials. And as you can see, we are killing insects <clears throat> using Cabofuran and uh, Saskan Maxi, but again, it's the distribution of that chemical <clears throat> uh, which is very effective. Uh, <clears throat> and incorporating uh, Saskatchewan Maxi in the soil helps to improve uh, uh, larvae kills. <clears throat> you can see here again, <clears throat> it's a three months after application, we're getting almost uh, less than 2,000 uh, beetles uh, and pupae 
in the in the strips. Now we follow this through to a semi-commercial stage by modifying a fertilizer spreader and apply the chemicals uh, in the in the hazard areas where we uh, stockpile uh, the uh, uh, logs and then harrow the chem uh, chemical in together when we were preparing the land. And <clears throat> when we look at the data, there is a lot more reduction in the Saskatchewan uh, Mexit uh, treated plots than in the untreated. So there is an option there for use of Mexit. Now the other option we were looking for is aerially applying the chemical. And these are uh, insecticides that we use. <clears throat> uh, initially we had uh, sachets prepared and then hang in the pumps. Uh, and you can see we were able to get a lot more kill. Uh, from the icon. Uh, icon is a wettable powder formulation of uh, lambda salahalatrin, and it's a commonly used insecticide for uh, ve uh, vector control in public health. <clears throat> and here you can see, after three months, we were getting up to 60 beetles killed per pound. And we can, we can measure and reduce uh, the damage. Uh, and if we get 60 uh, beetles killed, we can reduce the uh, damage uh, down to two fronts per pound. <clears throat> the insect at the rates trial here again show that we can get away with the rates <clears throat> by reducing our icon control. <clears throat> but we may uh, have to, uh, because the icon disappears quite quickly, so we may go back to our 100, 190 grams or 100, uh, 250 grams. Sarcometrin does not uh, work very well. So here we can get up to uh, three months of control. And if we can correlate that with the damage levels we get. There is a very strong correlation, but <clears throat> you know, and the last slide, the second last slide, which I want to discuss is that here we're proposing a, a integrated pest management for CRP. <clears throat> uh, and this has been uh, recommended to NBPOL, and I think it is now part of the uh, uh, replanting program. So pumps are failed. We chip the, chip the uh, palms, make them into small uh, pieces, and then leave them to dry and rot. <clears throat> because uh, cheap material rots very quick, uh, quickly compared to the uh, whole logs. And then we plant uh, legume cover crops with our material. Now, this is very important because <clears throat> with the roots of the LCC in the breeding sites, it discourages the females to lay uh, a lot of eggs there because the material is now used as a mulch and not a breeding site. <coughs> and if, <coughs> if there's plenty of money to go around, then we can incorporate Saskatchewan Mexico. But otherwise, else uh, legume cover crop in uh, cheap farm uh, material should be sufficient. And then we plant oil palm seedlings eight months, five to eight months later. And we monitor the uh, spray of icon <coughs> at, the, at the base of the uh, spear, uh, spear region of the palms. And, <coughs> and then, uh, yeah, that's the uh, IPM we want to uh, in incorporate. And <coughs> In general conclusions, uh, the situation at uh, GPOL has now changed quite a lot. Uh, and uh, CRB is now under control there. Uh, we can get over with 120 grams of uh, icon. Uh, destruction of uh, breeding sites for the control of uh, CRB at replanting is very, very critical. <clears throat> Saskan Mexi can be used. But again, it's an immediate property 
it is uh, mm. in the band list of uh, sustainable network agriculture. But, <coughs> the whole thing, the whole objective was to replace carbon footprint. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lester. So that was um, very good and complements the other work that was um, done earlier on um, in Hawaii on insecticides. And I think where we have the, the new outbreaks and very limited outbreaks, I think there is a role for um, using, using insecticides. But um, so that's, that's useful, very useful information to add to that. Any specific questions on the insecticides? Oh, okay. Um, last uh, person is Katayo Sagata. Is Katayo still with us? Yeah, I'm here. Can we try again? <laughs> yes, yes, I, I, I try. You're going to look at the um, oil palm plantations in PNG. Yeah, just well, just one study. I'll try to talk about it. Uh, is it okay now? Here yep, we go. Perfect. Uh, so yeah, this uh, presentation was done by. Dr. Mark Aero and uh, his uh, staff are uh, from uh, Battery. I just came in, and this is my three months here, so I'll just talk about one study they did to control um, uh, CRV in one of the farms in West New Britain province in PNG. So this is PNG, uh, this main island here, and that's uh, uh, West New Britain, uh, New Britain province, uh, the West New Britain province. And this is where they did the study at uh, Numundo Plantation. And that's the map it shows. And this uh, study was done in uh, replant, that's uh, uh, palms that were two to uh, five years old. So there were some CRB uh, infestation over there. So Mark and his boys uh, did uh, some uh, substrate evaluation for CRB nesting and how uh, that's related to damage level. So uh, we, they did the study, uh, assessed the different breeding sites. Uh, that include the cow down, because uh, at the Numuna plantation, they have uh, cows as a part of a, a sustainable uh, uh, programs. And they also look at the empty fruit plants and uh, stock uh, feed for the cows. And also they look at the, uh, the dead oil palm plants and those were poisoned for replanting. So when they look at this, they also look at uh, collected uh, the uh, eggs, CRB eggs and larvae and prepare uh, a response to this uh, different uh, uh, substrate for breeding, uh, CRB. So one of the traps uh, they use is the, uh, the uh, pheromone traps that uh, Dr. Lastus and Dr. Mark talked about. Uh, this, uh, the pheromone traps are actually placed in the second scene uh, uh, Pixar here, has a, it has a two open openings. So inside one of the openings, there's a, a pheromone traps here. Uh, at, all right, this lure right up there here. And this is a male aggregatory uh, pheromone. And every time uh, it drains out, they are replaced. And there's, in a plantation, they place like a one uh, trap. There are two hectares. Then it will check uh, uh, every week. So you can see on the ground, uh, so the uh, filament traps is a bucket at the bottom. So when the um, uh, beetle hits the uh, opening after it falls into the bucket with some sort of litter and they collect the uh, beetles. So in terms of assessment, uh, the boys has surveyed uh, two pumps every, on a, a second row in a, in a uh, plantation for a total of uh, 10 pumps covering 10 rows. So it gives a sample size of 100 pumps uh, when they actually looking at the uh, beetle infestation. So the plantation is, uh, uh, has 120 pumps per hectare. 
So it was around like three hectares. So this uh, damage assessment was done uh, every month. Uh, so that's in 2018 and 19. So sampling of the virus or the uh, fungus was done uh, weekly and those uh, beetles were brought back into the lab and dissected for uh, virus and I think fungus uh, infection of the eggs and uh, gut as well. These uh, beetles were actually collected from the uh, uh, pheromone traps, the PVC pipe traps. Another uh, uh, substrate they look at was the uh, effect of the, fun uh, the, what, the fungus, the metarrhizum on uh, uh, artificial breeding sites, uh, the EFB, the empty fruit plants, and I don't know what the PKE stands for, maybe Mark can explain, and uh, the palm uh, trunks. So they sprayed the metarrhizum about 10 grams per liter into the, uh, uh, the artificial uh, substrate to see if um, the CRP can infect those uh, substrates. And they were checked on a monthly basis. So the results come out that uh, when you look at the substrate infection by the CRB, you can see uh, most preferred the substrate was the uh, dead palm trunk standing. So the egg, the larvae, people and adults all have, have high uh, incidence on the standing uh, palm trunks. And some bit on the larvae on the fallen trunk as well. So it's mostly on, uh, on the fallen palm uh, dead trunks. Yeah. So when we look at the uh, ah, oops, sorry. pheromone Can damage I level, uh, hey, the pheromone on the damage yeah, yeah. level. Hello, hello. Could, excuse me, All could right. everybody please mute their mic? Um, except for Kato, I can't hear what he's saying. Okay. I'm hearing some background, so I'm kind of uh, post part. But if you look at this graph, uh, the, it shows the effect of pheromone traps on a damage level in the Nomura plantation. So you can see like uh, from earlier on in 2018, the beetle was, uh, CRB was really high, population was high, but as they continued to trap, the population was brought down to like control level, really few, like less than 50. Uh, that's the effect of uh, the uh, infection of virus, uh, fungus on uh, CRB beetles. As you can see, the more beetles we collected, uh, they collected from the Mundo plantation, uh, the fungus also uh, infection also decreased. It's basically, just less beetles, so uh, fungus was less fungus was found in the uh, guts. And the fungus infection or metarrhizum infection on uh, artificial substrate, uh, we we'll tend to find uh, more infection uh, in at least in all of the substrates, uh, but. More, there were more healthy ones than infected ones. As you can see, the healthy ones, there are more numbers, especially in adults, and there's less uh, infection in the uh, uh, ABS or artificial breeding sites. So uh, based on this uh, uh, study over two years, uh, we tend to see that in, uh, at least in Nemudo in P, uh, West Nubian no, West Nubian province, CRP tend to prefer uh, palm trees, uh, that's a uh, uh, Cut down or dried, and, and we can actually control it by just using um, a pheromone traps, using the PVC pipes, and or even a virus or fungus infection. But when I look at the metarrhizum infection on the substrate, it didn't have any effect. So, uh, so we think that a CRB using PVC pipes is uh, more effective than uh, they were using a fungus or a chemical application. So here in Numundo, uh, we, Mark and his boys actually have uh, effectively controlled the population down to a uh, uh, low level. So they actually moved the, the uh, CRP traps, uh, PVC traps to other sites because population at the moment is very low and pumps are recovered and they're doing well. Yeah, so at, from this study, we think that this is just just using PVC filament traps is uh, more, more effective than using chemical or other ways of uh, controlling them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kotao. 
Um, right, that's the the end of the uh, formal formal presentations, um, and I think that they've been um, they've been it's been very good to have presentations from from different people, some new people, and uh, particularly from what we can learn from the oil palm industry uh, in this, because oil palm the oil palm industry is working with a much more intensive situation than what we get if we're, we're working with um, village spread uh, in coconuts from, from village to village. And so it um, gives us some, some new, new ideas that uh, can be used um, and applied where we, we, we need an intensive effort, like the situation in uh, Vanuatu, New Caledonia, and, um, and even in Hawaii, where we're trying to get, get absolute control. Um, so thank you, thank you for that. Are there any specific points on the, on the last presentations that anybody would like to follow up on the pheromones or um, uh, IPM in PNG? Uh, I would just uh, like to ask, uh, in uh, a number of countries like um, PNG, and also I think was mentioned in uh, Palau and uh, uh, New Hebrides, they're looking at uh, release, releasing metarhizium and I was wondering, have there been any studies in those countries to check whether there are strains of metarhizium that are already endemic in those countries? And if so, are the endemic metarhizium strains uh, uh, having an effect on uh, the introduced Tyrannosaurus beetle? Uh, this would be as against uh, introducing new strains of metarhizium on top of whatever endemic strains of metarhizium may be present in those countries. Yes, Jeff, um, maybe maybe I can just make a quick comment because um, there was some work done by the, um, the Taro Beetle Group, uh, which was operating the Pratt program in the late 90s. Um, and that looked for indigenous uh, metarhizums. We looked at, for indigenous metarhizums with them in, in Papua New Guinea. Um, there are um, some isolates of metarhizium um, available, and we are asking our colleagues to um, send those to Laura Villamizard, who's a fungal specialist who works with us, um, to look at the the different the different strains that we've got, because if there is a a natural strain that's having an effect uh, locally, then it's adapted to that local environment, and uh, it could be it could be more promising. What we do find, what I think the experience would be in um, both Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea, and uh, uh, is that the level of natural infection of metarhizium is very low, um, but we do know that we can enhance that and get um, metarhizium infections within, within an area. Now, Aubrey's done probably the most, most work on this and got a, a after release of metarhizium. Um, well, Aubrey might like to, to say, Aubrey, have you got, um, can you recall that data? Yeah, just out of my head. Um, so we, for a long time after the rhino beetle arrived on Guam, we were looking for metarhizium and didn't see any signs of it at all. So we, uh, we got permission to import metarhizium from the Philippine Con uh, Coconut Authority. And we brought it in, we brought in spores and we disseminated it in several ways, uh, sprinkling the spores on breeding sites. And actually the shake and bake method, which is putting some spores in a bag and putting beetles in there, shaking them up and letting them fly off, auto dissemination. And it disseminated very readily. Uh, within a few months, we were finding metarhizium in places where we hadn't released it. It had got there by itself after the initial release. We followed up doing a, a pretty extensive uh, survey. And it turned out that about 20% of our beetles, that's all stages, were infected with the, with the, uh, the fungus and we were seeing quite a bit of mortality. However, that level of control was not enough to prevent the big population explosion that we got after a typhoon. 
So as far as I know, the Mandarism is still very active out there and it's being used. Um, we're actually putting it out there, you know, on, on known breeding sites as, as a kind of a, a biological pesticide. But it's, the response wasn't um, as much as, as we expected to get. Uh, but we're probably getting about 20% mortality, but it's not enough to knock down the population at this point. Thank you. Trevor, this That's is wrong. Right. Jeff Fudley. Add, um, that in sites that were infested, known sites that we did infest, um, I was able to recover um, ERB <laughs> in those sites that were <laughs> infested and there were some dead ones as well four years later. So there's a residual effect that we should also be looking at. Yeah, thanks, Roland. I, th I think it's a it's a it's a component um, that can contribute something to control, but it, it's not one that we can um, rely on uh, to be, um, you know, a, a single magic bullet in, in any way. That's my feeling, anyway. Okay, we're over time now by twenty minutes. Um, there are. I see there are a lot of questions on the um, methodology and um, uh, for, well, first of all, <laughs> let's just review what we've, what we've done through the meeting. Um, and I think that's been able to widen, widen our group and get experiences um, from our colleagues in uh, um, New Caledonia, Vanuatu and, um, and, and others and the Northern uh, groups as well. Um, in their practical experience, because our, our role in this, our, the importance of, of this group is to limit the spread of, uh, of CRB, of these invasive CRB populations, whatever they may be, um, and reduce the impact on, on the ground so that we are um, able to, uh, so that we don't end up with highly damaging CRB right through um, all of the Pacific Islands, which is the, the logical endpoint if we, if we do nothing. So to do that, that takes short-term efforts and, and longer-term ones. And some of the short-terms are the awareness programs that, um, that SPC is running, uh, the work around ports to prevent um, export from known areas. And I was really pleased to see that um, Vanuatu and um, New Caledonia have got um, regulations in to prevent movement of plant material out of the out of the infested zones, and um, the Hawaiians will will know that um, uh, their experience is that once the beetle is established, it's very very difficult to um, to control it with the technologies that we have at the moment. Um, so. It's good to share these experiences and, and build them into the responses that, that we see at the moment. The other side is how we can do something better. Um, we believe, as um, I think many, many people do, what the, the success of the original uh, Arictes virus in reducing populations to a manageable level of CRB to a man manageable level is, is an example that um, uh, you know, still um, still stands, and uh, the virus is still there. And in those original original areas, the um, uh, populations are not showing the damage that we see in the, the new outbreak areas. Uh, we have the the um, the new. We have definitely haplotypes which we can uh, follow for population monitoring. Uh, we believe that the uh, what what is called the um, CRBG, the clade clade one uh, particular haplotype, uh, Aubrey will tell you that that is pretty much resistant to uh, any any virus that we've tested against it. Uh, we've shown the same results in in Honiara, um, and uh, and it's reflected by the fact that in the environment uh, outside, you know, there there is no no virus there. In the population, but anyway, we have uh, from particularly uh, from some some of our colleagues, um, the um, um, 
there's a lot of discussion about the methods that we're using and the interpretation of those. And so I suggest that's a very good topic for the next meeting. Um, and um, Kaivan has expressed some, some very strong views that uh, the um, haplotype uh, determination of, um, of CRB is useless. I, I think that's pretty um, provocative because it's at a, at a pretty strong statement. So, um, and uh, I think he agreed to write down the case for that on a, on a page, why, why he considers that. Um, then I think we need to look at the methods that we're using and we have some different interpretations of the, the methods that we're using and, and the whole questions of um, virus infection and the importance of infection because if a, if a beetle is asymptomatic to the virus, how is it releasing virions into the, and you can't see it in the histopathology, how is it releasing virions into the into the environment? So lots to lots to discuss, um, and uh, I see some new ideas and uh, botanicals and endophytes are interesting. So there's there's new new ideas. So Trevor, can I interrupt? It's okay. tech here. Yep. Uh, it's uh, regarding the statement about Kevin will provide uh, uh, his his opinion in, in a page here. I wonder if that would be a share or? I hope so. That would be my my view. So I, I think not, we, not, not only to you, but is it to, is it going to be shared yes, with the yeah. community? Okay. No, this this group is an open group. <laughs> we are an open book. We share everything. Um, yeah, no problem. All of the things that we've said are recorded and will be shared around. And. Um, uh, this is science. And what, Keep things and, out and the what about the, the, the chat? <laughs> the chat right. history? What about the chat history? I think we can print that out as well. But um, Okay. Because uh, uh, I think I saw somewhere that he mentioned that uh, Taiwan population of CRB is native. Perhaps I, I, I read it wrong somewhere. But I, I thought Kevin mentioned that. But that's not what the, the genomic data suggested. Uh, in the real HL paper in molecular ecology 2018, they found that there was an introduced population in Taiwan. Yes, these are, these are questions that are obviously worthy of discussion uh, yep. because we, Thank you. Um, <laughs> and when, <laughs> <laughs> and how long ago was is is introduced? You know that's that's the other thing because we have the populations right up to the Japanese islands, as well. And um, yeah, we don't uh, we don't know. But um, I would propose I'll, I'll talk with um, the um, Aubrey and um, and Mark, um, and we'll uh, try to um, put together a, a, another another meeting. Um, in one month or two months, two months time. But in the meantime, you have the, the addresses of, of everybody. If you've got information you'd like to share or you can share, please send it to the, the whole group. And uh, it will be, Aubrey can, Aubrey's the, the wizard at this and can pick it up and, uh, and flick it on to, to everybody. So, um, uh, so with that, I'd like to um, really thank everybody for participating in that, in, in this meeting. Uh, I think we're getting better at the webinar, webinars, but I think to me, the main thing is that they shouldn't be too long <laughs> and uh, should have specific um, elements within them so that we are uh, looking at specific issues rather than an ongoing discussion for, for, for everybody. But um, that's, that's, that's my view. So, Anyway, I'd like to thank everybody because it is now 4.30 um, and uh, I, I think it's been a very good session and um, I look forward to hearing from you and seeing you all next time. So, Aubrey, do you want to, from the control centre, do you want to say anything? Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Trevor, for moderating and thanks to everybody that attended and participated. Um, I just put together a, uh, a CRB action group email system, old fashioned listserv, and I will send the address to everybody. And if you want to communicate with everybody, you just send email to one address 
and, and everybody will get it. I think everybody's used that kind of system before. Email seems to be the, uh, the common denominator for our group. We've tried uh, Wikipedia, Facebook, and WhatsApp, and they didn't seem to thrive. So let's try this, uh, this listserv idea, see if that thrives. I also will be sending you a link to the CRB reference library that Jim Garcella and I have put together. There's over 450 articles in there, including tech reports and uh, project progress reports, that kind of thing. I think you'll find that very interesting. It's really easy to search and anybody that wants to contribute to that, uh, I'd be willing to help. Uh, so that's it for me. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay. We'll leave it there. Thank you, everyone. And uh, see you next time. Okay.